thank you very much for attending this uh, Pack Your Lungs um, Special Graduate Seminar Series. So I'll be presenting uh, my dissertation results entitled Estrogenic Contamination of the Bulletin and its Potential Impact on Fish Health. So the Laguna Lake is a vital uh, freshwater resource, not only for Metro Manila, but also to the surrounding uh, provinces of Colorado. And uh, because of this, no, aside from being a vital freshwater resource, it, it performs many environmental services. Among its economic uses are the following. It's used for fisheries, as a water source for irrigation, for power generation, and also for industrial pooling. It also provides for recreation and other domestic uses, the most recent of which is it's being identified as a potential uh, future uh, water supply source for natural media. Um, another important uh, environmental service provided by the lake is that uh, its importance as a flood reservoir. This is in light of the recent typhoons that hit the Philippines uh, in the past uh, decade. And also, aside from that, one important, uh, one important environmental service that has been said to threaten its uh, overall or long-term uh, sustainability is its being an absorptive sink for residuals of human activities. So the LLDA has identified uh, sources of waste materials that, um, that end up in the community. And the majority of this originate from household activities. Also, in addition to that, uh, waste also come from industries and from agriculture. Uh, various agricultural sectors such as croplands, livestock and poultry production, and also fishery activities. Now, um, all of this, all of this um, um, man-made activities or all of these anthropogenic activities are associated with the release of a group of compounds with hormone-mimicking activities. Now, um, these compounds are collectively known as endocrine disruptors, and these have been identified as an exogenous substance or mixture that alters the functions of the endocrine system, consequently causing adverse effects not only to the organism itself, but also to its progeny and even its combinations. Now, um, among the various um, compounds comprising this group of pollutants, we have uh, one group that has merited the most attention and the most focus, and these are known as the environmental estrogens. And probably it's because um, estrogens play a very important role in the body, not only for growth, but also in the maintenance of, um, of um, adult functions, particularly that of the reproductive tract, in, in vertebrates, both men and in uh, both uh, female and in male. Now, environmental estrogens does not only include those that are man-made or those that are synthetic, but also include those that are originating from biological organisms themselves. So, the most uh, potent of this is the 17 beta estradiol, which uh, I will abbreviate in this study as E2. Now, um, this. Uh, this slide shows the watershed, the Laguna Lake watershed, including its 24 uh, sub-basins. And then, um, more, more recently, or in, in the recent time, um, the National Statistics Office has placed the total population of humans living on the watershed to be uh, amounting to around 13.6 million. And the projected annual population growth rate in the watershed is 2.76 percent. Now, um, information or data coming from the Laguna Lake watershed places uh, that uh, among these 13.6 million, around 2 million do not have access to septic tanks. And as you can see from uh, from this slide, the majority of the population comes from Marikina, followed by uh, Monte Lupa and then by Santa Rosa and the Cabrillo areas. So these households with no access to septic tanks, we can assume them to be dumping their waste, their sewage, directly to the lake. So men and women 
uh, which of course comprise the human population are source of natural estrogens. And of course, due to the absence of wastewater treatment plants in municipalities, we can assume that all of these um, natural estrogens that come in the form or, or that is carried by the urine and the fecal material is received by the lake itself. And not only that, we can also uh, include animals, no, domestic animals, um, as among uh, those that uh, could be potential sources of these natural estrogens that, uh, that are received by the lake. Now, um, I would like to just reiterate that we excrete this hormones in an inactive form, but uh, usually when they go out of the body, they're already conjugated forms of estrogen, primarily in the form of estradiol sul sulfates. But as it reaches the water system, it becomes activated again. Uh, to the pro uh, this is due to the process of deconjugation that is performed by the natural microorganisms that's found in the lake. So being active, uh, it means that the substance in itself can elicit uh, changes in the body that is um, uh, true to the effects that is elicited by the active estrogen. So um, this uh, figure shows, just shows us that um, researchers have also found that these um, estrogens, uh, including the natural estrogens, and those that mimic the effect of estrogens, which are endocrine disrupting chemicals, all of this would uh, bind with the receptors for estrogen that's present in the body. And um, as a result, uh, a cascade of events happen, all of which uh, would lead to estrogenic effects. That could be seen not only in females, but also in the male segment of the population. So among the different effects that have been documented, uh, are um, most commonly are the reproductive abnormalities in both humans and in wildlife. Now, uh, among these effects, are the feminization um, effects that have been noted in female uh, in, in the male fish in particular? So you can see here a picture of the development of, of uh, an ovarian tissue within the testes, which is the male gonad. And then also in the male fish, they have also found out that exposure to this exogenous or outside sources of estrogen leads to the production of a yolk protein, which is known as metallogenic. Now, um, in the female, this protein is used in the development of the egg. But in the male, this protein would have no target tissue to act on. So it would just be uh, distributed uh, around many tissues of the body, leading to uh, many adverse effects. Now, the main concerns of my dissertation are the following. Is the Laguna de Bay contaminated with endocrine disruptors, more specifically, sediment beta estradiol? And then, um, one important thing also, do these compounds pose a threat to the fish population in the lake? So to answer, or to at least get, um, to address these concerns, um, we have employed this methodology. So basically, we have collected water samples from the lake and have it analyzed for uh, 17 beta estradiol levels. Uh, in particular, um, we have, uh, I have uh, collected water samples at the east and the west bay of the Laguna Lake. And um, there have been, there were 16 sampling points. And uh, these were uh, subjected to the laboratory for hormonal analysis. In addition to that, we also uh, performed fish cage studies, wherein uh, we subjected common carp, male common carp, and uh, this, uh, Male common carp are caged along uh, specific areas in the lake. So as you can see here, this is a GIS generated map showing the precise locations of the fish cage along the east bay and the west bay of the lake. So we have um, fish cages set up in Paete, in Laguna, and also in Santa Cruz, in Calamba City, and along uh, Santa Rosa uh, in the west bay. Now, uh, these fish were um, were placed in the cage for approximately uh, 30 days. 
Now, we also use a reference group of fish for this um, dissertation. And this reference group of fish were housed at the UPLB Technological Research Station. Now, after the caging study, um, biomarkers were studied and were investigated. Now, um, these biomarkers are mostly uh, for the purpose of determining whether the fish themselves are exposed to estrogenic substances in the day. Now, this include the endocrine parameter that I have used, which is the vitalogenin levels, and also um, the testes were also examined for the presence of any abnormalities. And aside from that, the fish condition within the area were also examined using the condition indicators and um, an immunological parameter, which is the Milano macrophage centers, which has been used as a biomarker uh, basically to indicate if um, an aquatic area or an aquatic ecosystem is contaminated with pollutants. Now this uh, slide shows us how uh, the fish was uh, sacrificed and uh, uh, dissected in order to um, isolate or to, uh, to isolate the testes and uh, deliver for examination. Now among the condition indices that I have used are the condition factor. Um, you can see the, the formula that I use for this um, for computing these uh, values, the hepatosomatic index, and lastly, the gonadosomatic index. So the latter two uh, indices are used to determine the proportion of the weight occupied by the liver in comparison to the rest of the uh, body weight. And all that also goes for the gonadosomatic index, which determines the proportion of the testis weight that, um, that uh, forms part of the somatic weight of the fish, or in comparison to the somatic weight of the fish. Now for the results of the study, so this table shows the levels of 70 beta estradiol in the water samples from the east and west of the Laguna Lake. And uh, there have been detectable levels of this hormone in the lake. And um, I have compared the results with those that were obtained from other Southeast Asian countries. And our values were 10 times higher than, the, than those obtained from uh, Southeast Asian countries such as Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, and Taiwan, and many other countries. So we have higher values obtained for the levels of 17 beta estradiol. So this just indicates that, uh, or this validates, uh, that there's indeed uh, the presence of these hormones, hormonal excretions, reaching the lake. Now this table shows the vitilogenic levels in the fish that were uh, caged in the lake in comparison to the reference group. And uh, we can see here that male fish developed or synthesized vitilogenin levels. Those that are caged in the lake had higher levels of vitilogenin compared to those that are uh, in the reference uh, group. And uh, this implies that something that is uh, estrogenically active is in the lake, thus uh, producing um, this uh, effect or this producing this protein in the male fish. Now with regards to uh, the morphometric data of reference and caged fish, um, the GSI or the gonadosomatic index, in, index um, did not differ from among the, the three groups but uh, we can see somehow a pattern wherein um, the cage groups showed lower uh, values in comparison to the reference group. Uh, many studies documented that um, as a response to estrogenic exposure, uh, males would have uh, lower values for the GSI. And the reason for that is because estrogen would um, suppress the growth of the testes. Now, with regards to the HSI, um, those that are caged, uh, in particular, the uh, fish coming from the East Bay, had significantly lower levels of or lower values for the hepatosomatic index. And um, the HSI, uh, together with the CF, um, I mentioned earlier that this um, indicate the general condition or the general health of the fish. And uh, this, this uh, factor or this uh, indices also indicate, um, indicate the environmental condition, whether the the environment to which this fish has been subjected are nutrient deficient. 
So based on the values that were obtained in this study, we can say that um, those that are caged would have or would be exposed or were exposed to a lower quality environment than those that are in the reference group. Now for the condition factor, we can say that uh, the values were within within the range that is um, uh, recommended for uh, freshwater fish species in tropical areas. However, we can see that um, in particular for those fish in the West Bay, um, this, have, uh, this fish uh, had values that are at the lower limit, lower limit of the uh, recommended uh, uh, condition factors for, um, for fish uh, in uh, tropical countries, freshwater fish in tropical countries. Now, um, I mentioned earlier that the tests were also examined uh, with regards to whether they develop any abnormalities and with regards to their developmental stage. Now, this table shows us that um, uh, the majority of fish uh, in all groups uh, had uh, similar levels of development in that um, they are in stage 3 or the late uh, spermatogenic phase where you can see that the testes would have the preponderance of mature sperms. However, there are some or a few of the, of the fish uh, used in this study, particularly those that are caged in the lake, um, have exhibited uh, uh, testes that are at, the, at an earlier stage of development. And uh, this could be due to uh, a delay in the maturation of the, of the cells comprising the testes. Now, with regards to the testicular abnormalities, we can see that um, the testicular abnormalities were noted uh, predominantly uh, in the West Bay and the East Bay fish. Um, in particular, uh, although there is no presence of testis ova or development of a variant fish in the testis, we can see that uh, there is somehow a rest in the development of the, uh, of the spermatogonia. Uh, arrested the development of the, uh, of the cells in the testes, in particular for the West Bay and the East Bay group. And aside from that, uh, there are also other um, abnormalities that were developed in this in some of the fish in the cage group that were that were consistent with exposure to estrogenic substances. In particular, I'm talking about um, the presence of a vascular and interstitial proteinaceous fluid which uh, in studies, um, they have identified this as vitulogenin um, that's present in the testicular tissue. So I also observed that uh, in this study. Now, um, this figure shows the pictures taken from um, some of the um, tissues, testicular tissues uh, in this study. So in A, you have here the interstitial fibrosis, which indicate that um, probably the the fish from where this slide uh, or where this tissue has come from is probably suffering or um, may be suffering from um, from a repair or, or, or is currently um, undergoing healing as a result of uh, repair. And then uh, in B, you have uh, increased levels of uh, spermatogonia in comparison to the levels of uh, mature sperms. And then in C, you can see here a macrophage aggregate which the fish develops in response to toxicants in the water. And here, uh, this is the one that I mentioned to you earlier, the development of a vitulogenin that can be found in the interstitial tissues of the testes. So this pink staining substance has been identified uh, in, uh, uh, in other studies as vitulogenin itself. Now, um, this, uh, this slide shows the actual pictures of uh, testis uh, coming from the reference group. So as you can see, and then um, this one com comes or came from the um, East Bay. So this, this fish, uh, this male fish um, was caged in the East Bay. And you can see the difference with regards to the weight of the testis. Now, aside from, aside from studies on the testicular tissue, I have also included or have also um, studied the development and uh, characterized characterize the development of melanomacophage centers, in particular with regards to their number and size. 
So, um, as I mentioned earlier, MMCs or melanoma macrophage centers um, are also used as biomarkers to indicate contamination of the lake with pollutants. And um, in other references, although there are very few, they have also linked the number and size of melanoma macrophage centers with fluctuations in estrogen levels. Okay, so in this table, this table shows us the number and size of melanoma macrophages. Um, we can see that those that are caged would have a higher number and bigger size um, melanoma macrophages or melanoma macrophage centers in their liver. So this uh, slide shows the actual picture of these melanoma macrophage centers. So these are actually uh, pigmented aggregates of macrophages. And um, there are three types of pigments that, can, that could be observed. So you have the, I'm sorry it looks like red here, but actually this is yellowish tan in color. And this, um, this corresponds to, to uh, lipofusin. And then you have the black, which corresponds to hemosiderin. And then you have the blue, which corresponds to, I'm sorry, uh, the black corresponds to melanin. And then the blue one corresponds to hemosiderin. Now, with regards to the pigment uh, distribution of uh, melanoma macrophage centers, uh, basically, um, the, for the other pigments, for hemosiderin and lipofusing, this, uh, the, their distribution did not vary among the, the groups. But there's one, uh, for melanin in particular, uh, we can see that they're more, uh, more uh, they're found in a greater quantity in uh, fish that uh, were exposed <coughs> or those fish that are caged in the lake. So in comparison to the reference site. So uh, to summarize uh, what has been done in this study, biochemical responses reflecting the potential of contaminants in the lake to impair physiological processes were analyzed. So in particular, emphasis was given to those uh, responses that were induced by 17 beta estradiol as part of a complex environmental mixture. So as I mentioned earlier, this, um, this uh, responses that were induced by 17 beta estradiol include testicular lesions and the development of or the synthesis of vitilogenia. Now, fish health indicators were also um, determined in this study. So in conclusion, Hormonal excretions of both humans and animal origin, both human and animal origin, contaminate the lake, as uh, determined by the hormonal levels of E2 that were determined in this study. And in addition to that, um, the, the study have uh, also obtained uh, that male fish have manifested effects of estrogenic exposure, where they have uh, demonstrated. Um, responses that are consistent with estrogenic exposure, in particular talking about the testicular abnormalities and vitilogenic synthesis in males. Now, observations in melanoma macrophage size and frequency imply the presence of a compound in the lake that exerts immunomodulatory or immunotoxicologic effects. However, as I also mentioned, um, there are certain studies that um, have a linked MMC size and frequency with exposure to estrogen in the lake. Now, whether or not this biological response, I'm talking about the MMC size and frequency, was induced by steroidal estrogen as part of a complex environmental mixture should be a subject of future research. Now, to answer the question, uh, we have already answered the question that, that there is indeed estrogenic contamination of the lake. But the question, another question is, does this pose a threat to fish health, to overall fish health? I would just like to show you this slide um, that uh, shows the schematic representation of the sequential order of responses to polluted stress within the biological system. So based on the result of my study, uh, the fish that have been uh, Caged in the lake have um, have uh, demonstrated early biomarker signals. So some researchers have uh, referred to this as early warning signals that indeed yes um, they have been exposed to this pollutant and they are producing effects that are not normal to them. It's not part of their 
uh, normal physiology or their, their physiology. Now, whether or not um, this exposure or this uh, early biomarker sites would progress to later effects that would affect not only the organism, but the population of fish within the lake um, would warrant, of course, uh, further studies. But as of now, we can say that, yes, um, there's this presence of pollutant, and uh, this has been producing uh, effects on the organism level. So um, some of the recommendations that are um, that we have come up with this study is that there should be strict implementation of environmental laws, standards, and regulations, particularly those pertaining to uh, waste disposal along the way. And then also there should be control or uh, prevention of future emissions in the watershed. In Britain, what they do is that they, they have incorporated the removal of hormones in the in the wastewater treatment. So um, it's possible to eliminate or to remove um, estrogens and other hormones in the lake. Particularly, um, this can be removed by the process of ultrafiltration, uh, which uh, some of the um, uh, which is one of the steps involved in purifying water. No? Now, um, this uh, this has been um, incorporated by uh, the British government as part of the discharge permits to uh, certain industries. And then uh, the third is the establishment of a basic sewage treatment facility in each home. So this is really, uh, this is very basic. And um, uh, if there is a budget, why not provide a sewage treatment facility at the municipal level? And then uh, next is the implementation of an effluent testing program for existing sewage treatment plants. So it's not just enough that um, you have an existing sewage treated treatment plant, but uh, it should also be ensured that the effluent coming from these sewage treatment plants would be free of hormones. And then lastly, to monitor uh, and evaluate changes in the environmental quality, especially those that are associated with endocrine disruption. So in particular, I'm referring to studies or monitoring involving uh, the uh, vitrogenic levels, histology of uh, testicular tissue and other uh, tissues in the fish, and population parameters. So I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Uh, once again, I'm Mr. Lazar Bregera. I'm from the Bureau of Research and Aquatic Resources. But right now, I'm studying because I'm a big part circus scholar right now. And, uh, and may I just clarify that I'm not a fisher scientist. I'm with the fisher's policy. But uh, somehow, I can, I can digest your, your highly scientific research. And I guess our fish, fish health section will be very interested about your research. But uh, my question is, uh, because uh, as you can see in your recommendations, you mentioned about environmental laws, standards, rules and regulations. But uh, in your research, I haven't, I don't know, I haven't seen the, the link of your research to issues like, that does it affect the population of the fish in the lake? Uh, does the fish supply will be affected with this contamination? And my second question is, what will be the effect of uh, estrogen contamination to humans? Uh, would this mean that uh, young men around Laguna Bay will be more inclined to be young women because of the estrogenic uh, contamination? So those things. Thank you. So with regards to your first question, which is um, the results of my study, can I already link it to the fish population? Do you see, do you see, any, do you see any link? of uh, estrogenic contamination to fish population reproduction in Laguna Lake. Say, uh, will it affect uh, the, 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 the stocks, the fish stocks of Laguna Lake? If uh, the, the fish will be more inclined to, be, to become female, like that? Um, based on um, the data that I obtained from, uh, from my research, um, it's that uh, in particular capture fishery in the lake has been on a decline. And um, I, I think it's too premature for me to say that it could be due to estrogenic uh, contamination of the lake, but it could be a reason. That's why I, I mentioned that um, there should be 
further studies that uh, must be done. Although, uh, based on what I, based on the results that I obtained from this research, I can see that effects uh, that could be due to the estrogenic contamination uh, of the link has already been uh, demonstrated in the fish that are used in this study. So probably um, the next uh, step is to probably uh, get uh, random fish samples from the lake, random fish, and then examine if uh, this wild fish population are being affected by, um, by, uh, by such contamination of the lake. Now with regards to your second question, um, are humans, um, do they have the tendency to be also affected by this um, contaminant? Again, it's too early to tell, but, um, but if you're going to look at the references, um, they have already indicated the decline in sperm population to this uh, group of pollutants. Uh, remember that um, this not only come from natural, this not only originate from biological organisms, but they are also pollutants that mimic the effect of the hormone itself. So they have mentioned that in Europe, the, de the decline in sperm, uh, in sperm count has been attributed to this group of uh, contaminants. But of course, it's it's still premature to um, to uh, to say it, no. But um, what the European Committee has done, as I mentioned in, in my previous um, lecture, is that they have adopted the precautionary principle, meaning the health of the people should come above all. So even without documented studies, they have um, they have they're doing um, or they're taking steps to uh, to counteract this potential effect or these uh, implications. <coughs> Yes, sir, the reactor is up. Bonnie Kevia from the National Crop Protection Center. Protection Cluster. Tanakula, during summer months, uh, like uh, April and May, they get a small task and eat I have already considered that when I was uh, doing, uh, okay. when I was um, planning the methodology for, for the research. And I have. Uh, preferred uh, getting water samples during the uh, rainy months or the, the rainy season it's because it's during this time the surface runoff is really very high and uh, there's also been a study by uh, Dr. Espanol and uh, Dr. Lasco before that um, in that uh, study they mentioned that the pollutant level in the lake is at the highest during the rainy season primarily because of the surface runoff so that's why I did not uh, include um, the summer season, but that could also be a, a very good uh, research to, to conduct later on. I would just like to reinforce uh, the uh, statements of Dr. Parazo. Dr. Parazo is uh, was my advice in her PhD uh, dissertation. Uh, I am very capital from animal science. This is especially with regards to the contamination of the food chain. I delivered this, this is part of my uh, professorial, centennial professorial lecture this last year of uh, the contamination of the food chain with these endocrine disrupting chemicals. We used actually the uh, Philippine monarch as a model and uh, we start we, uh, we stuck at that level in the food chain. Uh, it's up, I think, and we believe that it's up for other people, who especially in the medical field, to continue the study. And we found alarming, uh, alarming results in regards to the presence of E2 uh, substances, E2 chemicals from uh, different contaminants that are pouring, that are being poured in the lake. This is take this uh, hazardous chemicals are toxic chemicals are taken in by the uh, uh, planktons, by the uh, uh, snails, by the uh, shellfish. This is being taken by the uh, mallard ducks, and this this uh, we detected this. Uh, we analyzed the samples. Uh, in, uh, UP Dilimani and SRI 
we found uh, alarming uh, levels present in the conventional feet of the molar dust, in the eggs of molar dust, in the flesh of molar dust. We found uh, destructions in their liver, we found destructions in their gonads, and uh, we stop up to that. <laughs> and we, but we, we know that the, right, the public has the right to know. We are just very careful because this will, I know that uh, whatever statement that we can we will make from these results, uh, this may affect the uh, Philippine, uh, Philippine mother industry and all the Philippine dairy industry. Uh, but we, we, but we, we, we honestly believe that the public has the right to know. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Capitan. May I have a supportive advisor? <laughs> Uh, I think I've made this observation in your presentation at the forum that uh, one of the observations in Europe was that one of the major sources of estrogen that gets into the water system was in fact uh, excretions from you know, urine, uh, from the toilets and so forth. And of course, the major source of this came from the women. Uh, now, but what is very alarming in your presentation is the fact that the estrogen or into level in the lake, the fountains are going to lay was 10 times higher than in any other regions in Southeast Asia. Ten times, and then come up a thousand percent. Anyway, this is kind of alarming. On the other hand, as I made some, I was interested in this skill and in my effort to get some better information. I don't know if this is just an informal information to be said, but there are things operators or would rather have male tilapia because it grows faster than the female and the reason for this is the nature of tilapia to hatch and keep the fry in their mouth for a week or so or even more than a week during this period the female tilapia does not eat and therefore does not grow as fast. But, so now they have introduced a new technology, hormonal, uh, hormones. And I don't know if this is right, but the hormones are derived from women urine. So, if this is true, perhaps, and if this technology is ongoing and delayed, then this is one of the venues for increasing the estrogen level. So I hope, I'm not sure, but perhaps this is a good area for study because the technology is already being part of the practice, I suppose. Thank you. Yes, sir. Just like Mr. Bigel and one of the circus scholars. I'm Mr. Bernard from DE. I'm actually from Talim Island. <laughs> that part there. Uh, yes. Now, my question is about why common carp is the sample piece? Does the, uh, your conclusion and findings represent the whole piece population? within the link. Um, originally, during my MS, I worked with a, with a much smaller fish. Um, it's the Daniel Aereo, or the silver fish. But um, in this dissertation, we would like to use uh, more economical important species, and the one that can actually be harvested from the lake, and that is the common carp. And one consideration also is because there is an ELISA kit that can test for that's the most important consideration. 
So there's uh, an ELISA kit that uh, can uh, determine uh, blood levels of vitamin in common car. So with regards to your other comment, uh, should we, or is it uh, right to um, generalize. to generalize or to uh, extrapolate the information that I've got to a wider fish population? Um, I would like to say that um, yes, it could, yes, it, it's possible. Although there there could be species differences, so um, we should also take into account that. Uh, these species differences could somehow um, alter the way by which fish could respond to this type of pollutant. And then also within the, we should also consider that within the species themselves, there could be genetic variation. So we have many considerations. But, but basically, um, I think yes, we can also, we can do that, we can um, extrapolate in other species also. But uh, with regards to uh, fish and then humans, uh, I think more studies are different. Um, do we have any more questions from the audience? Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I'm Dr. Mala of uh, College of Veterinary Medicine. I'm the uh, advisor of Dr. Barrasco uh, in her undergraduate uh, thesis. <laughs> uh, I'm very much uh, interested about the uh, public health uh, importance of this one. Now with uh, your finding that uh, there is high level of this uh, endocrine uh, mimicking uh, substances, is it safe to eat fish now from uh, Laguna Lake? Actually, um, I'm more concerned with uh, not not only fish, but the use of the water in the lake as a potential uh, drinking water for Metro Manila. Uh, there have been uh, news that um, this would, this uh, resource would be tapped as a source of uh, uh, water supply for the whole of Metro Manila. So. Based on the levels that, uh, that were obtained in the study, um, this should be really considered by, um, by the concessionaire. So in, in case he wants to, or the concessionaire wants to uh, distribute uh, this water as a potential source of drink drinking water in Manila. So probably um, there has to be uh, the implementation of uh, proper, uh, uh, proper treatment of water so that it could be purified and that the hormone would be removed prior to reaching the, the nesting hub or the residential uh, settlements around the lake. No, I mean the fish. Because uh, definitely if the level of uh, these substances uh, uh, increase in the uh, Laguna Lake uh, water, definitely the residue of these uh, substances will also increase in the uh, fish. So, uh, would it be uh, a well, danger of I will uh, prolonged uh, eating, uh, particularly males? <laughs> I would advise not to eat the most delicious part of the fish, which is the belly, because it's, uh, remember that uh, the estrogen is uh, steroidal hormone, so it's a fatty hormone, and usually it localizes in uh, the fatty tissues and the belly is where you can find the most fat. So aside from that, I will not also advise eating the egg, which you call the geek in Ilocan. So that's, I would not also advise that because uh, of the, but then, uh, because of the uh, localization of this uh, substance in this uh, dishes of the fish. I think so, yeah, so Something to add to that point, Dr. You know, Maala, actually, Dr. Uh, Paras, things are becoming bad for all of us with regards to this issue. No? That's the same question was, uh, that was asked uh, uh, to me with regards to uh, the safety of eating uh, balut uh, 
a salted egg and a water duck meat, no? Because uh, up, to, up to now I can say we, it's very hard, it's very hard to caution people uh, from eating these products. I remember there's another uh, another scientist who studied other fish, no, Michelle? It, it includes bangus, it includes the lab, uh, hito, and other and other fish in the lake with regards to the heavy metal consumption and presence of these toxic chemicals. But uh, this study doesn't, our study also uh, did not uh, uh, continue to the level of, trans, of transfer of these chemicals to humans uh, by way of the food chain. So we are not really at that uh, stage to caution people. And besides this as a social impact, this is a social impact, especially for people who have their, you know, who depend on the lake for their livelihood. So this will create, you know, a really a, a very big uh, problem for uh, for all the people living uh, near the lake. And uh, but then uh, we still believe, we still believe. For, for uh, I honestly believe, for me, that uh, there is what we call bioaccumulation, uh, especially with these uh, different hazardous chemicals in the different tissues, especially in the reproductive system of these uh, uh, animals that are members of the parts of the food chain uh, who uh, get these hazardous chemicals from the leaf. And uh, this, uh, when this bioaccumulates, this will uh, tell something in the future. No? So, I don't know. Uh, uh, we believe that there should be really further studies along this line because uh, we are consuming products from these uh, animals from the lake. Thank you very much. Um, any more questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Well, uh, just following the comments of the gentleman uh, who raised uh, the issue, uh, I commend you for your courage to conduct the study in a good way. Because being from BFAR, I've heard stories of researchers who conducted uh, research in the lake and uh, generated not so good to the air results to the consuming public. But they're constrained to divulge the information because uh, you have the capitalist cage operators going against you if you're going to release that uh, information. But, uh, just like what the uh, previous gentlemen have said, the public has uh, has the right to, to know the information. Thank you. Yeah, and besides, uh, that's the that's the that's the uh, primary purpose for which we conduct research, no? uh, to find answers to these uh, questions. If we will hide our findings, then uh, I think uh, there's there's no fun to conduct research. No, yeah. it's just only a matter of time. Uh, I think that uh, the public should really know this one. Thank you very much. And also to add to that, uh, yes, uh, I did encounter some hardships while doing the research, but uh, I believe that again it was worth it because I got, I answered my questions, and I also have to offer Kapitan and the rest of my panel members to uh, thank because they have uh, shared my vision. They, they. Um, they uh, encourage me to, to go on and finish the visit.